Hi guys. It has been a while since I've done anything on YouTube. Um, has this taken more takes than I should like? Yes. Am I going to continue until I get this finished? Yes. Um, so hi. I've been promising to do a review of The Legend of Vox Machina for absolutely ages um, and I figure today's the day when I'm just going to sit down and talk about it a little bit. Um, and yeah, I could talk a, a lot um, and because I'm, you know, just free-flowing my thoughts, this could end up very rambly. But um, in brief, I've been a critic for a very long time, uh, literally from day one of Geek and Sundry releasing it on their YouTube channel, um, I was kind of obsessed. Um, I did the whole staying up all night to watch it on Twitch until I realised how unhealthy that was and then switched to VODs. Um, but I have watched all of Campaign 1 every episode probably about five to six times. I'm, I'm, I very much enjoy reabsorbing content and seeing things and kind of finding rhythms and when I've reabsorbed it a couple of times putting it in the background and just having it like familiar friends. Am I slightly strange? Yes. Do I care? No. Um, similarly, I have now watched the whole of the Legend of Vox Machina animated series about six or seven times, maybe more. I've watched it with several different friend groups, um, as well as highly recommending it to a lot of people who want to absorb a D&D experience, but don't have the time to dedicate, because it's a lot of dedication. Um, and so yes, I'm going to talk about it. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the things that are kind of obvious when you have this much financial backing genuine passion from the original creators and uh, the acquisition of it by Amazon. These three things prove beyond a doubt that you're going to have top tier production, top tier acting, top tier music, top tier visuals, top tier animation, direction, editing, all of those things. The only question is whether or not this would fail or succeed is in adaptation. Um, you have well-built characters already in, in, in existence. You have all of these things that relate to a really good, complex, interesting story in a very in-depth world. The only question is whether or not it transitions from improv to series. Um, and I really love the changes that they made. I will still always love the OG version. That is my OG canon. Even if things were changed for the series, the OG canon is still the improv. However, all the individual choices made for the improv are amazing. <laughs> um, they really, they tell the story in a more complete way, ironically. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about is the difference between improv or role-playing storytelling versus traditional media storytelling. Um, so traditional media storytelling in general, it kind of, you have control over the whole narrative. You know where it begins, you know where it ends, and then you can weave things in between which connect. Um, so you will have a kind of ebb and flow and it feels kind of poetic. In improv storytelling, particularly with role-playing games, you can have a level of foreshadowing, you can have a level of poetry from character choices, um, but it's harder to weave because you don't know what your characters can do. Your characters are still alive, they're still breathing, they can do anything they want. Um, so things like Keyleth giving Percy the skull, the little raven skull, doesn't seem significant. It was just a random character choice, but if you were to view the whole narrative, it feels like beautifully woven foreshadowing. Um, there's things that a DM can do equally where they are doing the same thing, where they're specifically deliberately weaving in foreshadowing, where they'll have plot hooks that are being foreshadowed. But actually getting that natural flow is much, much harder. Now, The Legend of Vox Machina, both because of the performers, the NPC, the, the PCs and the DM are extraordinarily talented and very lucky, most of the key moments within the narrative of Campaign 1 are very... They, they do read like poetry. It naturally got incredibly lucky with this absolute wave. Now, particularly, for full spoilers for Campaign 1, potentially the Legend of Vox Machina series going forward. Spoiler alert. I'm not going to do timestamps. Just deal with it. 
watch or don't. Whatever. Um, when it comes to character deaths, every member of Vox Machina dies at some point. Every member of Vox Machina has a significant metaphorical, cathartic death that relates to their character progression. Except for Keyleth. Now, there's a difference between character choice and player choice. Player choice is something that is incredibly hard. Player choice is something that is at table, it's improv, it could go anywhere, it could be something that is out of the player's control which affects the storytelling. Um, it could be something that's very specifically a mistake in hindsight. Um, DM mistakes also happen. Um, while character choice is fully taking into account the world and also when you're taking into account story linearness. Now, when you're talking about the deaths of Vex, for example, perfect example, Vex dies because she has a insatiable greed and is close range when Percy triggers a trap. So much significance to this moment. This is her abject greed, which is a result of her character feeling underserved, feeling underloved, feeling underrespected, um, desperately wanting this force for survival, this wanting to live, wanting to live and be respected, that comes out in what seems to be abject greed. Um, and perfectly parallels dragons, something which she's obsessed with. And she dies because she's greedy, trying to poke in on a trap that Percy activates. Percy, who feels guilt, who feels rage, who feels all of these things and is starting to open up after his trauma with the Briarwoods, kills Vex. <laughs> At the same time, when her brother is just happens to be down a hole, out of the way. The one who would check for traps. All of these give significant, powerful, intimate character movements and character motivations for all of us going through and has a huge effect on Vax's plotline going forward. This is an incredibly lucky set of circumstances which lead to a narratively rich death. And the same thing happens for all of the other characters. Pike's death is pretty stream, but significant. It's her taking out a feed, it's her trying to um, be the protector, be who she is, and that significantly changes her character. She goes more militant, she goes more aggressive, and she and Grog kind of bond more because of that. Um, Vax's death at the hand of the Kraken, helping out Keyleth. Significant! <laughs> um, like, that's a lot! Um, as well as him already having his kind of relationship with the Raven Queen. These things mean something. They mean things narratively and in the depth and in making important reactions and kind of a falling cards effect against other characters. It creates good drama, it creates good narrative, and it seems to have this almost poetical flow to it. Grog! killed by Craven Edge. I'm sorry to go into full spoilers, but we're gonna have to do this because it just kind of, I want to explain how meaty and important each death is in this series. Grog's death by Craven Edge is a representation of his fight against toxic masculinity and the feeling of his tribe where in order to be significant and powerful you've got to be aggressive, you've got to be cold, you've got to only think for yourself. Um, Kevdak is this perfect embodiment of this feeling of entitlement and aggression being the key way of gaining power, while Grog, on the other hand, learns that he is better with his friends, his family, all of this sort of thing. And Craven Edge, this evil manipulative weapon that's so much more intelligent than Grog, chips into that feeling of powerlessness and makes him question where he wants to lay his strength, where his strength actually lies. It's significant! Um, I'm trying to think of what characters have I missed. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I could go on and on and on. Oh, Scanlan. Scanlan's an interesting case though. Scanlan's death, though not significant so much in of itself, is again part of his arc. He is a very charisma-based dad and he, more than any other character, creates his own story. That's potent. He pushes his own narrative and pulls his own character out of the narrative when he has a death at the hand of a mythological beast when he feels insignificant in this world. He feels like he's just a singer, he's not worthy of these heroes. Um, it's significant. Keyleth jumps off a cliff. 
and turns into a goldfish, which is beautiful, perfect D and D. It's beautiful, perfect. The player consequences. It's not narratively rich. It's not. The only thing that is narratively rich about it is the reaction, which at that point they are basically gods. Like death is not significant to Keyleth at this point in the story. It doesn't matter. It wasn't character based. If it was a player choice. It was a player mistake. Brilliant. Hilarious. One of the most iconic moments of the entire over many, many, many hours worth of franchise. Not character significant. However, Keyleth defeats Silas. Delilah killing Keyleth. While Keyleth is protecting Vex is narratively rich and a perfect use of adaptation it is so good and like the more i digest it the more it is perfect <laughs> for this scenario it's so it's so telling of keyleth's character that she would throw herself in front of things to protect someone else it's important narratively to vex who at this point the only person she's ever relied on in the story is Vax. He's the only person that she trusts and wants to reach out to. She sing like specifically throughout the entire series she has lines about it not being her, it could be worse, it could be her. Um, you know, all of those sort of mentality of desperate survival that she's had to live with so far and the person that she's kind of been putting down is the one that jumps in front of the bullet for her. That is so important. It's something that spurns her character choice. Um, it shows Percy's fall, the fact that he's so indifferent. It really pushes the narrative with Vax a lot further. Um, it's, it's a huge moment then, rather than it being what was originally in the original series. Um, Vex is the one who gets um, dead, I think she just gets knocked unconscious. Um, she doesn't actually die die in that moment, um, but having Keyleth take that moment is so significant. It's so important and it's brilliant adaptation. Um, similarly, um, the use of Archie, making Archibald a cruel dwarf played by Dominic Monaghan, um, who's a badass and a leader and kind of everything Percy realises he doesn't want to be but kind of needs to step up to is a great way of making that character arc work. Um, at first when I saw the casting I was like, oh interesting, this is just so that, you know, if you can diversify your cast, have different people in the cast, have more female characters, for example, with um, um, the other main character in Whitestone, and I'm blanking on it, I'm sorry. Um, if you have able to cast outside of the sphere, why not? Why not make this cool guy a cool dwarf? But what it means for Percy's character is there is someone that he can look up to, someone he cares about, someone he can lose, um, that is significant and shows what a leader could be. That is good adaptation. Um, originally him being a grumpy old man, fine, it's fine. But when you're looking at the character arc that Percy's going through, having a different character is significant. Um, so yeah. <laughs> How long have I rambled on for? I'm not going to even look. It's been a long video. Um, other adaptation things which I really, really flippin' loved um, is, you know, they did the Scambo, but they also really played into Scanlan's insecurities for future development. Um, same, okay, go into character choice versus um, role playing choice. Pike, so significant. Pike's change from her being. Um, just absent because Ashley was absent and having her rebuild a temple is fine it's fine but it's not character the character it's not significant for the character like had her character gone off and built a temple it's fine doesn't do anything for her character it helps in the long run maybe with Sarah Mary and her relationship with Pike but it doesn't help her but having her instead making the choice to try and work out what the difference is and try and redefine what a cleric is because I think people who haven't played D&D and know the cleric struggle I love clerics. Clerics are my favourite class. I have played multiple clerics um, up here. This one? 
it's ye. She's my, she's my, one of the clerics. Um, I love clerics. I love them so much. But in order to play a cleric, you've got to deal with the dichotomy of clerics. You've got to be a support class who can also do damage. And that is frustrating and it is hard. And learning how to balance your more kind of aggressive power side with the healing side is an emotional roller coaster. Um, specifically the way I've coped with it is either having full combat clerics or full healing clerics. That's one way that I balance it emotionally and having those characters that really have a really specific thought process behind it. I still have my unresolved character who is my first ever character who she was a storm cleric and I've never been able to resolve her issues which are many. Um, one of which is dealing with that dichotomy and having that presented in the story as dealing with the dichotomy of wanting to be angry and aggressive but also having a lawful or good patron and trying to come up with that internal balance visualized love it so much oh my gosh i love it so much the fact that you can be a badass you know go for a punch up get drunk type person but still be considered holy the the concept of holiness the concepts of lawful shit cake not being the answer um is great fucking love it um and also gives that character more authority in the moment yes they significantly upped the response when she finally arrives in whitestone but dang is it not cool um and they also do put in little like this temple can harness a bunch of power justification line which means that they can get away with it and not then have to like seriously pull back on that power spike later and be like oh she was really powerful that one time but now she's just a normal cleric etc um <laughs> i have talked so long oh my gosh um things that i think could have been a little bit improved um Obviously, in terms of adaptation, going back to story arcs, having looked again and again at the Underdark questline, it is not significant character-wise. There's the beginning of the budding relationship between Vax and Keyleth, her struggle with being underground, um, but that's pretty much it. There's not that many character-rich moments in that first arc, which makes sense because it was their first one streaming, they weren't sure if it was going to work, they kind of wanted to go back to the game, it all went tits up. There was a significant character that left <laughs> before the Briarwood arc, um, so um, that is not narratively, narratively rich. However, it did introduce Kima, um, and really there's a lot of stuff that happened pre-stream which is truly foundational. Um, the fact that Amon um, and the kingship of Taldore, um, the what the reason why the king steps down is not just the Briarwoods. It is it's three strikes. There's the demon possession. There's Krieg. And there's the Briarwoods. That's three times that the ruler of a country has been manipulated, schemed upon, had people in his close circle that this has happened to. Um, and because of those three different incidences, I think possibly a fourth one involving another dragon, don't quote me on that, um, there is a relationship by the time the campaign starts in campaign one between the Vox Machina and the Council of Teldori, specifically Elora. Now, obviously they streamlined it, cut it all down, for the sake of the series, and I understand that adaptation or choice. That being said, it is it does feel quite rushed, and also, I love Elora. Elora is the only character that I've cosplayed from Critical Role because I flippin' adore her. Um, and I think she was very underserved. And because obviously you don't have the Underdark arc, Kima is heavily underserved as well. And even though there seems to be some level of LGBTQ plus representation in the series, it's very underhanded. Um, the, the one exception being Scanlan, um, which is great. 
Um, it's progression is progression. Yay. But Kima and Alora are such important, interesting characters to me. And because you don't have the Underdark arc, Kima is just a nothing. Um, you know, they gave other characters much more significant roles for the current arc. Archie, p mainly. Um, uh, you also have Jared being much more important and giving a completely different role, but also still serving basically the same purpose. Great. Um, but Kima and Alora, I think, are heavily neglected. Um, I don't know whether or not that was ma like in terms of story, it makes sense for them not to be uh, to not be primary focuses. Um, but I feel like the whole of the Tal'Dorei Council, Council meme as it is, was a bit neglected. Now I think I'm hoping they might make one of the less interesting vestiges be a quest in the Underdark or involve maybe Kima going off on her own to get a vestige to save them from the dragons and ending up in a similar predicament and becoming a more important character because of it. Um, maybe that'll be a way that they'll loop it in. Um, in terms of the Underdark, most of the significant moments that were worth commenting on they've kind of already done. Um, but I think it'd be a shame if they didn't do something involving Vasselheim before Vecna. Um, I think they need to have Vasselheim based things or a reason to go to Vasselheim. Um, and I think they need a reason to make Kima an important character other than just a member of the Tal'Dorei Council. So I don't know whether or not going forward in the next couple of seasons they'll kind of mix and match. There was a couple of less interesting quests for the vestiges, so I'm hoping that maybe a good way to loop that in would be to have Kima going after a vestige, getting a little bit out of her depth, Alora asking them to go after her, them going after a vestige instead of the Horn of Orcus, and then that will lead them into Vasselheim so they can get Vasselheim and then we can have characters like Cash and um, at the moment none none of the characters who were in Vasselheim or the um, Slayer's Take are featured and they are really important particularly towards the end of the story um, so I think it'd be really if they can rework some of those character beats going forward I'd really like that and I really want there to be more Kima and more Alora because I love them so much um, I also think in terms of one of the things I didn't like so much um, is Matt left it very ambiguous what happened with Cass, uh, with Cassandra. Um, whether or not it was some form of, like Stockholm Syndrome is not the correct word, but um, manipulation, long-term abuse, long-term um, gaslighting, um, and a little bit of a charm on the side, he never confirmed, as far as I can find, he never confirmed if... Cassandra was specifically under an enchantment or it was more I think they like in the series they actually like uncharmed her a couple of times just to make sure so it was much more deep in terms of where they left it while in the show they made it very clear she was charmed and she was bitten two things which aren't confirmed at all in the series I also really wish they did something like maybe we'll get something with Kynan like small insignificant characters but they mean so much in the long term arc um so i hope they maybe do something with kynan later on obviously amon is having the criminal conclave happen so i don't know when they're gonna bring kynan in if they're gonna bring kynan in it's kind of past the point of bringing him in but he's like a significant side character that means something um in terms of like showing vax's character um and again it's significant that again Talking of death scenarios, it is significant to me that Kynan is the one who sh nearly kills Keyleth during Percy's death battle. Like, that feels really narratively rich to me. Um, that the person that Vax wasn't able to see went off, got himself into trouble, and became a shadow company through, um, <laughs> through Ripley, and then is the one who causes the most significant to harm to someone other than Percy in that battle. I think these things are significant and worth doing and I I would it, I feel like these narrative virtual moments would be a shame if they weren't at least alluded to um in future seasons. But there we go. Um what other things? Uh let me just quickly check my notes because I've been talking for so long. Um ba -ba 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 -ba. I think I've already talked about all of these things. Do, 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 do. 
it was so much lovely foreshadowing, so much lovely character moments. All these things were going to happen. Um, all the Vaxlith little hints. Um, like, I really like the fact that because they, again, from a structural standpoint rather than a narrative and meaty character moment, the fact that they also switched the damage attack to Keyleth rather than Vex meant that when they had the encounter with Orthax, you had the most powerful character out of commission um the most powerful and the most moral character out of commission obviously there's an argument for pike obviously she's automatically out because at that point she's been dispelled but having that really um ha having keyleth not be significant to the percy fight i think is really important because then you can highlight vex and cassandra in that Percy fight, which is the more important characters in that particular scenario. Um, so I think just, oh, so good. It's so good. Oh my God. How long have I been talking? This is like probably like 40 minutes long. Ah. Um, <laughs> uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. um, I enjoyed the primeval awareness thing for Vex. I think it's a little bit over the top, but there was a lot of like big anime vibes, particularly with Percy um, and with um, Vex's I can sense dragons headaches. It's a way of doing primeval awareness that's a little bit up there, but it's something. Um, da -da 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 -da. um is there anything else on my notes? Or did I manage to get it all off? The amount of death and carnage? Holy smokes, this is not a series for kids, and I love it. Swearing, violence, sex. It's great more adult content for fantasy peoples not in a necessarily sexy way but like yay yay for adult content um da -da 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 -da. um let's see <laughs> all of the secret mercers the d20 and the lens flare um the um like, there's so many little Easter eggs that I love seeing visually. I love catching visual cues and things. And obviously, this is a visual medium from what is basically mostly an audio medium, other than the character reactions. I like to watch Critical Role, which is why it takes me so long to get through the series. Um, I can't just put it in the background because I want to see all the player reactions and the ooh moments. Um, but I do love the amount of work done to make this so detailed and so rich and visually phenomenal um so yeah i think that's most of my thoughts i'm sure there's something else that will pop out later on that i'm just like oh why didn't i say that genuinely i love this adaptation i'm so excited for future seasons i'm so excited to where they're going to pull the plot arcs and because again campaign one is phenomenal and i love it um but the pacing is sometimes a little bit squiffy um they have that year break in the middle um the Terrian section is so important and so interesting but some of the wild mount stuff is just a little bit weird um there's a lot of stuff that i think they can really work with and having the time and the space to adapt it to a dynamic story i'm so excited because there's going to be so many surprises because when you take these things that are amazing in the long form but a little bit kind of wibbity wobbity and take the time to plan them, organise them, and structure them. Oh boy, I'm so excited. <laughs> Can you tell I'm excited? I've been talking for ages. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed, um, and uh, yeah, see you on Twitch probably, but I'll try and do something on YouTube by and by. I don't know. Tell me what you guys want to see, <laughs> and I will see you guys when I do.